This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1002, recorded on April 26th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York... Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. It does. It still feels weird to say a thousand, Daniel. Because <laughs> a thousand and two. Yeah, it's hard, and it's like when we when we went into the two thousands. Remember, two thousand and one. You had, but now we're used to twenty. <laughs> we say twenty twenty three. So I guess I could say. 10 1? No, that doesn't work. No, nah, it doesn't work. All right, forget it. We'll get used to it, just like we're in the <laughs> 900. All right, Dan. We, we will. Well, a little bit of a change because you know I, I got a lot of feedback at TWIV 1000. Um, people always want to know what bow tie I'm wearing. So now I'm going to have to keep track and, and go through. And also, not only will I have quotations, but try to have my bow tie appropriate for the episode. So I hope that my antibody or immunoglobulin bow tie is appropriate for some of the things we're talking about uh, tonight. In the future, it'll be uh, pretty much viral motifs. But what, let me start with our what do you got? What do you got on for socks? Do you have something interesting? Uh, you know, they always match the bow ties. So. Wow. Good for you. <laughs> okay. Our society must make it right and possible for old people not to fear the young or be deserted by them. For the test of a civilization is the way that it cares for its helpless members. And that's Pearl Buck. Actually, one of our listeners sent me that quotation. So feel free to send quotation suggestions. It's it's actually rather similar to another um, quotation I talked about before, just about how um, we can really measure ourselves by how we treat um, you know the the most vulnerable among us. I don't say I wouldn't say I'm helpless, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> but I, I don't think of you as an old person there, Vincent. So nobody thinks of themselves as an old person. And maybe that's part of our challenge here. But I'm going to jump right into COVID this time. I'm going to try to keep this um, focused. Um, but just a reminder, and I think this is really important. Um, we are still seeing thousands of people being hospitalized each day here in the U.S. because of COVID, not just with COVID. Um, about 60% are 70 or over, 60%, meaning about 40% are under the age of 70. Uh, we're still seeing we're still seeing th over a thousand um, deaths each week, narrowly defined as due to COVID within the first 28 days after being infected. Um, we're still seeing excess deaths, you know, above that one million we've already accumulated. Now, a common denominator, I'm going to comment about these um, hospitalizations. I think it's really important. At this point, 99% of the people here in the U.S. has either been vaccinated, infected, or both. So the common denominator here, these people are vaccinated, they're previously infected, but they're not being offered antiviral treatment in the first week. People are just saying, I hope you do well. And, and I'll actually share a story that sort of, I had to take a deep breath um, at this. So I'm at the nursing station, one of the hospitals. And one of the physicians, I don't even understand why people are giving out this Paxlovid. No one really gets sick from COVID anymore. No one dies or ends up in the hospital from COVID. And I looked at him. I said, well, if you'd like, you can walk 10 feet and look in the window of the gentleman who just got COVID, who is now on a non-rebreather, and we're having goals of care discussions because I don't think he's going to survive. You could explain that to his wife. And then you could even talk to the doctor who did not offer him treatment in the first week. Okay. Take a deep breath there. Another deep breath. <laughs> All right. Um, so right up front, you know, we talk a lot about preprints. So I, I wanted to mention the research letter, completeness and spin of med archive, preprint and associated published abstracts of COVID-19 randomized clinical trials published in JAMA. Um, so in this investigation, the researchers examined publication timelines, completeness, and spin in the abstracts of all randomized clinical trials, RCTs related to COVID-19 posted to uh, MedArchive during the first two years of the pandemic and compared um, uh, 
you know, with their published counterparts. And they found that one in five of the Med Archive preprint abstracts remained unpublished for at least 12 months after posting. So sort of interesting. It ends up there 12 months later, it's still not published, which tells us something about it. Um, the most interesting um, was that these preprints that remained unpublished were less complete, more highly spun than preprints that actually went on to be published. And they also commented that adoption of COVID-19 treatment protocols based on erroneous preprints suggests they say potential problems associated with less complete, more highly spun preprint abstracts. Uh, I don't. I don't think suggests. We clearly saw that people with an agenda were putting stuff up there as a preprint. Some of those studies, as we later learned, never even happened. They weren't even studies. They were fabrications, and they influenced um, patient care. They actually had some pretty significantly negative impacts. All right. I'm going to move on to testing. All right, because we started off pretty rough there, and, and now I want to um, let's move on to some cute puppies. So maybe it's time has passed for this one, but I'm, I'm still thinking we can learn a lot for the next time. So here's an article: lessons learned from a COVID-19 dog screening pilot in California K-12 schools, published in JAMA Pediatrics. And I've got some some great great photos from the from the uh, article here. Uh, I know uh, you're, you're probably enjoying those, Vincent, and uh, mm. we will leave in a link so people can go in and enjoy this as well. So so here's the cool part I have to say. No swabbing armpits and sticking um, you know, gauze in sniffing cones at some offsite. You know, here, the dogs just direct, directly sniffed the people. And they actually have this picture. And, and you've got these little kids mm -hmm. and they're, they're facing forward. Apparently this is for, um, I don't know, health, health care, privacy. They say it's for privacy. So the kids are looking for it and the dogs are walking behind them. And if the dog suggests or senses that the child might have COVID, they sit down. Mm -hmm. And so the the dogs, you know, alert their handlers. Um, the the people are looking away. Those that are actually, you know, the, a dog sits down behind. They they go ahead and they they do a confirmatory test. And uh, but they really, they ultimately going to test a lot of folks so they can get a sensitivity specificity. So just having a dog, you ready for this? Just walk by, sniff the ankles and feet of the people. Sensitivity eighty three percent. And a specificity of 90%. Now, you can imagine, I want to know about CT values and the ones they missed, um, but we're just using antigen tests in this study. But, but what a wonderful way to, to screen. Uh, mm, it's great. All right. So hopefully we'll have that in the, the next, you know, the next pandemic. Um, all right. Maybe we'll even have it in the future. So, so moving into COVID active vaccination immunity, um, and we're going to be sprinkling in a bit about reinfections, talking a bit about antibodies today. And actually, we're going to even hit on reinfections and associated risks next time as a nature paper out there that I, I want to spend a little time discussing next time. So um, that's like the the Marvel, you know, preview of what's coming ahead. But um, the article. SARS-CoV-2 Reinfection and Severity of the Disease, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis was published in Viruses. So this is a systematic review summarizing the results of 23 studies addressing SARS-CoV-2 reinfections. Um, a total of 23,231 reinfected patients were included with pooled estimated reinfection rates ranging from 0.1 to 6.8%. Um, reinfections were more prevalent during the Omicron variant period. Um, the mean age of reinfected patients um, in these studies was about 38 plus or minus six years. Um, the most common symptoms during first and second infection were fever, cough, myalgia, fatigue, headaches, um, no, this, this is interesting because, you know, every, every new variant, you know, there, there's a news article about how you can tell it, you know, apart by clinical pattern, <laughs> no significant differences of clinical pattern were observed between primary infection and reinfection, right? So you're getting one later on new variant, you get reinfected. Oh my gosh, you can't tell them apart, but, but, you know, if you read the newspapers, you can, no significant differences in the severity of infection were observed between primary infection and reinfection. That, seemed a little surprising to me. Now, being female, 
being a patient with comorbidities, lacking anti-nuclear capsid IgG after the first infection, being infected during the Delta and Omicron wave, and being unvaccinated um, were all associated with a higher risk of reinfection. Um, so interesting. Um, you know, I, I think it's worth um, looking a little bit more more closely. Um, you know, a couple things that people might be asking about. Um, you know, weren't, weren't we told that that new variants were less virulent? Um, so. In these reinfection studies, the most frequent variant SARS-CoV-2 circulating at the time of reinfection in countries where studies were conducted were alpha in four studies, delta in four studies, Omicron in two studies, um, other variants in five studies. Um, and what I really like, they've, they've got a nice um, far spot where you can actually look um, as far as hospitalizations, ICU transfer, um, prevalence of hospitalization during the first infection, 12.8%. And the second infection was 10.3%. Now, transfer to the ICU tended to be lower during the first infection than the second infection, so about twice as high with the second infection. So that that was a little bit surprising to me as well. So uh, we'll we'll be revisiting this with um, some more data next week. Um, but I want to give a little background with a preprint, and then we're going to be talking about boosters again. Um, and I, I just want to say, don't shoot the messenger. I am sharing the science. But uh, let's start with this preprint. Effectiveness of Coronavirus Disease 2019 COVID-19 Bivalent Vaccine. Um, so this was posted as a preprint. So all the qualifications. Um, but important is that we are not just looking at antibody levels here. We're asking that simple question. Did the vaccines provide protection? So our sophisticated listeners are certainly asking, what type of protection, Dr. Griffin? What do you mean? Protecting us against what? Here it is, protection against infection. So this is interesting, right? Because we've talked about, you know, the first, you complete that series, you've got maybe three shots, so you've had a couple infections and then a shot. Maybe you've got that hybrid immunity. Um, we have that reassuring message that the science supports that that durable protection against severe disease, hospitalization, long COVID is, is durable. Um, but what about getting a boost? What about three to four months of just reducing your risk of getting infected, right? That's, that's what we're talking about. So among 51,017 employees, COVID-19 occurred in 8.7% during the study. So 4,424. Um, now, the bivalent vaccinated state was associated with a lower risk of COVID-19, but now this is the really important part to focus on. It was associated with that during the BA4-5 dominant period, so about a 29% lower. Um, we see BQ dominant about a 20% uh, lower, but decreased risk was not found during the XBB dominant phase. So estimated vaccine efficacy um, was maybe 4% um, for all these XBB or Griffin variants. Um, maybe. this, But this was not statistically significant. So maybe it helped a tiny bit or not at all. So <clears throat> with this context, uh, last week we discussed the FDA EUA modification for the bivalent uh, vaccine. And so today I want to touch on the CDC's response. Um, so we hear that the CDC simplifies COVID-19 vac vaccine recommendation, allows older adults and immunocompromised adults to get second dose of the updated vaccine. So very much a sign off on the FDA um, modifications. But, um, and I'm going to go through this slowly and kind of hammer on it a little. So these changes, CDC, include CDC's new recommendations allow an additional updated bivalent vaccine dose for adults age 65 years and older, and additional doses for people who are immunocompromised. This allows more flexibility for healthcare providers to administer additional doses to immunocompromised patients as needed. So you'll notice they're commenting that this allows access. We don't see here anywhere an encouragement. Um, let's move on. Monovalent vaccines no longer here. Um, now, the CDC recommends that everyone ages six years and older receive an updated bivalent mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, regardless of whether they previously completed their monovalent mm. primary series. Okay. Um, now, 
remember, this isn't an additional one, right? This is basically, you know, finish that series uh, with a bivalent at the end of it. Individual ages six years and older who have already received an updated mRNA vaccine do not need to take any action unless they are 65 years or older or immunocompromised. And for young children, multiple doses continue to be recommended and will vary by age vaccine and which vaccine was previously received. Um, I will make a comment here, which they make, alternatives to mRNA COVID-19 vaccines remain available for people who cannot or will not receive an mRNA vaccine. Um, CDC's recommendations uh, for use of the monovalent Novavax uh, or the J&J were not affected by these changes. So, so here we are. It's during the time we're, we're living in the day of XBB. So the fact that a bivalent shot may have in the past uh, given us a bit of a boost and a, a small window of protection against uh, infection, it's not clear, actually, that bivalent boosters actually even boost or that they even provide any protection against infection for XBB. So protection against disease it is durable. And I mean all disease. I mean um, ending up in the hospital. I mean dying. I mean developing long COVID. Uh, but it's not so compelling that boosting actually boosts. Do we need a boost to protect against disease? Or is the previous course sufficient for that? You know, it does look like the previous course is is durable. It okay. looks like it's still holding strong. I think that's because that, that T cell memory is still there. Um, so if you know, the yeah. boost does not actually boost, then why are we recommending it even in older? I can see immunocompromised maybe, but 65 and up blanket, why Why that? Yeah, I don't think we're actually recommending it. I think, And I think that's the point here. It's not so much recommended as they're allowed to. Here. It's just, yeah, we've just said, you know what? If there are certain contexts when a physician, a patient want to go down this road, you have this access, you have this option. Mm, that's tough um, because how are they going to, from my, from our view on this program, Dan, you get emails from physicians who don't know what to do. So <laughs> how are they going to make it? Yeah. No, I mean, I think at this point, you know, and we just had an urgent care call and, and I'm not recommending it actually. I'm saying, you know what? We'll see maybe in the fall. Maybe mm -hmm. we'll have a, you know, and, and this does, this does raise, maybe we will have a form, a new formulation because it doesn't look like the current one is really doing it. Um, it will be interesting if some people go ahead and if we get some new data, I'm always, you know, that, that's science. We're always waiting. Is there any information that informs us in a different direction? But right now we're, we're not seeing any um, compelling data and, you know, small percentage of people got the last boost. I, I don't expect there to be a huge uptake here. What's the percentage? Do you know offhand? Um, it's like less than twenty percent, I think. Okay. Of, you know, folks got that boost, so yeah, not a not a huge amount. But but I do have some good news, and I think this is important. That was the end of "Don't Shoot the Messenger." I'm just sharing the science. Um, I would have loved if we had some great data that boosting really boosted. But COVID passive vaccination, right? And this has been a tough. Um, area for those folks who are immunocompromised, those folks who could not get that um, that response. Um, so AZD3152, I teased about this last time, it is a new antibody from AstraZeneca that may be able to neutralize, they say all known viral variants. This is envisioned as the ebu shelled substitute. Um, so the, the data was actually presented at a as, as a poster at the 33rd European Congress of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. Um, they've got a six letter acronym, I'm not gonna bother. Um, Copenhagen, Denmark, that was April 17th. Um, so there's actually a, uh, the Francesco J et al. The SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibody AZD3152 potentially neutralizes historical and currently circulating variants. I think that is um, honest. So. AZD3152 was derived from B cells donated by um, convalescent patients after SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, AZD3152 was optimized with the same half-life extension and reduced FC effector function and complement C1Q binding as EVU shelled. Um, the extended half-life is expected to confer protection um, from COVID-19 for six months. Um, and th that's just something, you know, it is interesting. We have the ability or people have the ability uh, to really modify the half-life of these agents to really almost whatever we want. 
want. Um, so there is an ongoing supernova phase one, three trial. This is a new one, evaluating the safety and neutralizing activity of AZD3152 for the prevention of symptomatic COVID-19 in adults and adolescents, 12 years of age and older. Um, Participants have conditions that cause immune impairment may and may not mount an adequate protective response after COVID-19 vaccination and therefore are at high risk of developing severe COVID-19 if they become infected. Um, they're actually, um, they're anticipating to have results um, in the second half of 2023. Um, and one of the things I'm sort of hoping is done here is a real focus on efficacy, not just on neutralization. Because as we've learned, we may have thrown some stuff away while it did, still had some um, some efficacy, just not neutralizing efficacy. So Janet, this is a single monoclonal, correct? Yeah, which has me a little worried. I, I sort of, this is great, but I, I almost would have liked to see it as part of a, you know, a cocktail with maybe yeah. another, maybe even three in there. So. Do you know what the, where the epitope is? Is it at the interface of ACE2 and, and Spike or is it somewhere else? Do you know? You know, I don't actually, um, you know, it is, it's neutralizing, right? So yeah. I'm assuming it's going to be in that receptor binding domain, but I don't know exactly where it binds. Okay. But just some antibodies against the N-terminal domain can also neutralize, but they're they're rare and less potent, I understand. So probably that's not here, but we don't have that data. They haven't published this yeah. yet, right? It's a poster. Yeah, this is, yeah, yeah I, I have very limited information. Just I've got, you know, poster presentation shared and, and yep. some links that people can look at. But yeah, a lot less data than I would like, and we will get more before this gets approved. All right, so let's move into that situation, that that window of opportunity that for, um, unfortunately, the gentleman that I described right up front, um, he tests positive. What do you do? Listen, I, I agree. Most people are going to be okay, but still, um, an individual gets diagnosed. If they're high risk, we have the ability to reduce that risk further. We have the ability to keep that individual out of the hospital to, to reduce significantly reduce their chance of dying, um, and even we're going to talk even a little more and reduce their chance of long COVID probably. So, number one. Paxlovid, number two, remdesivir, number three, malnipiravir. Let's talk a little bit more about that today. So um, I will say an exciting article, more from a mechanism standpoint. Um, the article, Malnupiravir and Risk of Post-Acute Sequelae of COVID-19 Cohort Study, was published in the BMJ. Uh, more data out of the VA. And here we have a cohort study, 229,286 participants who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 between 5th of January 2022, 15th of January 2023, it's about a year. Um, and had at least one risk factor for progression to severe COVID-19 and survived the first 30 days after testing positive were enrolled, right? So we're, we're forgetting about any sort of potential benefit here to mortality because we're going to look at something else. 11,472 participants received a prescription for malnupiravir within five days of the positive test and 217,814 received no COVID-19 um, treatment. Now, PASC, post-acute sequelae of COVID, was defined based on a pre-specified set of 13 post-acute sequelae. Um, they reported that compared with no treatment, the people that survived, um, the folks that got malnupiravir, use within five days of a positive uh, SARS-CoV-2 test result was associated with a reduced risk of PASC, relative risk 0 0.86. So about a 14% um, reduction at absolute, and I think this is important, absolute risk reduction at 180 days was about 3%. Um, Post-acute death, um, they actually, you know, give us a hazard ratio there. Post-acute hospitalization, um, and, and I want to point these out, right? So the post-acute death, right? We've we've narrowly defined. I talked up front about dying from COVID as dying within those first 28 days, but people then die in the next 180 at a significantly higher rate. If you follow the folks that got malnupiravir um, out to 180 days, the hazard ratio is 0.68, so 38 percent reduction in that post-acute death. Um, and we're also seeing a 14% reduction in that post-acute hospital admission. Um, malnupiravir was associated with reduced risk of eight 
of the 13 post-acute sequelae. So less um, dysrhythmias, less pulmonary emboli, less deep vein thromboses, and less of that fatigue and malaise, less liver disease, less acute kidney injury, less muscle pain, and less neurocognitive impairment. Um, and this was across the board. Molnupiravir was associated with reduced risk um, in folks that had not received a COVID vaccine, still out there, folks that had gotten one dose, two doses, people that were boosted, people that were getting it the first time, people that were reinfected. So all the way across the board. All right. Number four, convalescent plasma, an early treatment option for the treatment of immunosuppressed COVID-19 patients at high risk for progression of severe disease who have no other treatment options. And remember, this is first week. The IDSA has recommended against the routine use of convalescent plasma on, among immunocompromised patients hospitalized with COVID-19. So it's too late yeah. right at that point. It's, it's too late. It's about timing. This is not saying bad yeah. stuff. They're just saying you've missed your window. Right. Okay. And then week two, the early inflammatory, the cytokine storm. Um, we have number one, we have steroids. That uh, looks like a target dose of about dexamethasone, six milligrams a day times six days, so six times six. Um, our anticoagulation guidelines, pulmonary support, um, remdesivir maybe if we're early enough, immune modulation, tocilizumab, maybe baricitinib, avoiding those unnecessary antibiotics and unproven therapies. But sometimes people have infections, probably about 10% of the time there might be a secondary bacterial or fungal process that you want to consider. And then we will wrap ourselves up with a few, I think, interesting articles and preprints. The preprint risk of new onset long COVID following reinfection with SARS-CoV-2, community-based cohort study was posted on MedArchive. Um, so this is a UK study looking at self-reported long COVID 12 to 20 weeks after each infection. Um, separate analyses were performed for those less than 16, those 16 or older. Um, in this preprint, long COVID was reported by those um, 16 or older, um, 4% and 2.4% after the first and second infections, respectively. Um, lots of limitations, um, but, but there is some consistency here with what we're seeing. We are seeing less new cases of long COVID, but we're seeing less. We're still seeing them. It's just, um, you know, so I want to point about that. Um, are we still talking about vitamin D? I still have that jar. I should actually take some vitamin D. But the article, low vitamin D levels are associated with long COVID syndrome in COVID-19 survivors was published in JCEM. Um, long COVID was defined according to the NICE guidelines. Um, so just let me pause here and explain. So National Institute for Health and care excellence. They sort of left the H out of there, but I'll leave in a link. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but what is that nice definition, NICE definition? Signs and symptoms that develop during or after an infection consistent with COVID-19 continue for more than 12 weeks and are not explained by an alternative diagnosis. It usually presents with clusters of symptoms, often overlapping, which can fluctuate and change over time and can affect any system in the body. Post-COVID-19 syndrome may be considered before 12 weeks, while the possibility of an alternative underlying disease is also being assessed. And then in addition to the clinical case definitions, the, the term long COVID is commonly used to describe signs and symptoms that continue or develop after acute COVID-19. It includes both ongoing symptomatic COVID-19 from four to 12 weeks and post-COVID-19 syndrome, 12 weeks or more. Okay. So now we got our definition. 50 long COVID and 50 non-long COVID subjects were matched on a one-to-one -one basis, enrolled from an outpatient post-COVID clinic cohort seen from August to November 2020. Therapies, comorbidities affecting calcium, vitamin D, bone metabolism, and or admission in ICU during hospitalization were exclusion criteria. Uh, they measured the vitamin D at hospital admission and six months after discharge. Um, they observed lower vitamin D levels um, at follow-up in subjects with long COVID than those without. Not a huge difference, 20.1 versus 23.2, p-value 0.03. Um, regarding the affected health areas evaluated in the entire cohort, they observed that lower vitamin D levels um, were found in those with neurocognitive symptoms um, compared to those without. 
And there was kind of a bigger spread, 14.6 in those with neurocognitive symptoms. All right, and I'm going to wrap it up with a uh, last article with a bunch of comments. This, this article must have gotten tweeted or something because I've been getting a lot of questions specifically about it. Uh, the article, Clinical Experience with the Alpha-2A Adrenoceptor Agonist Guanfacine. That's Guanfacine, G-U-A-N-F-A-C-I-N-E, not to be confused with something else with a bunch of similar letters, and N-acetylcysteine, NEC, for the treatment of cognitive deficits in long COVID-19. Um, this was published back in November, um, but as I mentioned, recently seems to have gotten a bit of attention. Um, a couple of patients just this last week asking about it. This is a case, uh, really case reports. It's a series of case reports. It is not in any way a placebo-controlled trial. 12 patients with brain fog, including difficulties in executive function, were treated with guanfacine. Uh, it's a medicine often used in ADHD. One milligrams PO at bedtime for the first month, increased to two milligrams after one month if well tolerated. And they also were getting 600 milligrams of the NAC daily. Um, I have to say the NAC at a 500 or 600 once or twice a day is being used quite often by a lot of folks uh, with long COVID. Um, this combination of guanfacine and NAC improved cognitive abilities in eight of the 12 patients. Four patients discontinued therapy, two for unspecified reasons, two due to hypotension and or dizziness, which actually are common side effects of guanfacine. Uh, so this isn't something you just give out. You, you need to actually pay attention. Um, those who stayed on the guanfacine and NAC reported improved working memory, concentration, executive functions, including a resumption of normal workloads. One patient briefly stopped due to a hypotension episode and then actually um, reported a return of cognitive deficit that abated, then resumed guana, guanfacine treatment. So, I mean, a couple comments here. This is a case series, and I always worry. Um, people put out case series. And one of the couple comments I'll make, one is the natural history of long COVID, of post-acute sequelae of COVID, in most cases, is, is gradual recovery. Um, so you always worry when you give people something, you know, did, did they get better? Mm -hmm. You get to take credit because you did something. Um, so the, these are things where, you know, we really need randomized control trials. Um, you know, I, I really find this an incredibly challenging area to practice in. Not only are people suffering, but I do not like the lack of evidence-based guidance in this area. We really need to change that. Do we have any idea of the mechanisms of guanfacine and, and acetylcysteine for long COVID? So we have ideas. So the guanfacine, um, I think we're thinking of it similar to ADHD, so having that, that neurological benefit. The NAC is purported to be an anti-inflammatory um, medicine, mm -hmm. um, antioxidant, et cetera. Um, I, yeah. I actually okay. have several patients who well, sort of swear by it, anecdotal evidence. Ouch, I can't believe I'm be actually saying that. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, low middle income countries, the rest of the world. Let's just remember, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, and I am hoping people, uh, more than one or two, will pause the recording, go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and click donate because we are we're now... Um, uh, we're kind of finishing up, actually, our ASTM and H fundraiser. This is uh, our last show that will drop. So February, March, and now just for the last little bit of April, donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled up to a potential maximum donation of $30,000 to ASTM and H. Um, and not only are we going to support them now, but in, um, in October, we're going to be headed to uh, Chicago to do another uh, live recording there. That's fun. I, I look forward to that. And hopefully this time we don't get COVID, me and <laughs> Dixon, right? <laughs> yes. All, All right. right. Time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Ephthymus writes, what an enjoyable thousandth episode. This is so exciting that TWIV has been this successful. Congratulations on this huge milestone. Dr. Griffin, during this episode, you mentioned you got infected with dengue virus twice before you became extremely curious about virology. I'm fascinated with dengue virus above all other viruses. I would love to learn more. Could you go into more depth about your experiences during both infections, which serotypes you get infected with, what symptoms do you expect to get if you get a third infection, and how deadly is dengue for every subsequent infection? Is the third much deadlier than the second? The, the data for this seems to be inconsistent, so I'm not sure what to believe. 
Yeah. So the, these are great questions. Um, so the, the first part, which I think is really, uh, I'll talk a little bit about my experience. So as I shared on TWIV 1000, um, you know, the first time I got sick, I had no clue. It was really in retrospect the second time that I sort of figured out what the story was. So, you know, we'll, we'll start with the second time. So it's the second time I spend a couple of weeks. I'm in Zambia and Zimbabwe. I'm canoeing down a river. I'm uh, camping out in pop tents, hiking through the bush. Um, I really had this silly idea. It was explained to me that if you stay inside a pop tent, um, you know, the elephants, the lions, the hyenas, they won't come in. You're perfectly safe. I mean, you know, seemed to work. Uh, but it was interesting. You'd wake up in the morning and there would be, you know, elephant um, footprints. They would just step over the lines that were holding the pop tents. And uh, so, you know, you just basically held it, held it in if you had to go until sunlight. Um, but on my way back from that, I started to feel sick. And it really was this classic, you know, of getting fever, horrible headache, pain behind the eyes. Um, then I had this this characteristic rash. Um, and then it was later that the platelets dropped. And that, that was when the history was sort of pulled together that for me, this was probably a second infection with dengue, probably with a second serotype, particularly with the gap of time. Um, but an interesting thing about it, I think this is important uh, just to use this as a forum to comment on, is the majority of cases of severe dengue are actually in children. And for them, it may actually be their first infection. Um, and so we always think of it as reinforcing infection. And we always talk about the antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, this enhancement, this fact that because it's a little bit off, it's actually improving viral entry into cells as opposed to neutralizing. Um, you know, and really, I was actually listening to uh, one of the first three episodes of TWIV where dengue was discussed. It's, we really think at this point, not dengue three, but dengue two is probably associated with most of the severe cases. Um, interesting thing, um, back when I got dengue in sub-Saharan Africa, no one believed dengue existed there. We now know it does, by the way. <laughs> it's one of those things. You don't test for it. It's not there. Now that we test for it, particularly in returning travelers, yeah, it's there. Um, so, yeah, it's a really fascinating, not only is it a fascinating disease, but because of that issue with one, um, one type of dengue infection uh, really precipitating potentially a severe second infection, um, that's why vaccines are so um, tricky here, because you've got to maintain high levels of protection against all the different serotypes. Matthew writes, I'm a healthy 45-year-old man who received the second dose of Pfizer COVID vaccine in 2021, three weeks after the first dose. I have not tested positive for COVID at any time, have not had any symptomatic respiratory infection for at least five years. I lead a normal life and don't usually wear a mask, so it strikes me as unlikely, although not impossible, that I have not had an asymptomatic infection. I eat a healthy plant-based diet, exercise 30 minutes a day, healthy weight, no medical conditions, I've heard you mention several times that the three-week gap was too short and the vaccine should really be considered a three-dose vaccine. However, isn't it likely that as almost two years have passed since my second dose, the memory B cells have already matured in this time with or without asymptomatic infection? I don't really see much value in a booster, and in some countries like the UK would not even be entitled to one. The bivalent booster is available to me, but I'm not inclined to get it as the risk of serious disease seems so low. Do you see any flaws in my analysis? I think this is reasonable. Um, you know, let, let's go through as you did. So you say healthy 45 year old man, it's really at 50. We start to see 65 is really when the risks start to go up. Um, you know, and I, I'm thinking in my head, as I say that of ending up in the hospital of, you know, dying of this, I'm not sure I can say the same about long COVID. That seems to be sort of a roll of the dice. Yeah. There is a age associated, uh, risk there. Um, yeah, we've talked about this several times. Um, you know, the three weeks apart made sense in the pandemic. It made sense because that was what the science was. It probably, from an immune standpoint, it probably makes more sense. Um, you know, if you're not under those pressures to to have a, a larger gap between those doses. So I'm not even sure if that third dose at six months is just properly timed, or if you really need three doses. Um, it'd be, you know, I don't know if we'll ever get the data, but it would have been wonderful to have a comparison of people that get up front, people that get a shot three weeks later, people that get 
a shot six months later, but didn't get or did get that shot at three weeks later. Um, but you also make another thing, which I think is, um, you know, there is a lot of, of SARS-CoV-2 virus out there. Um, have you been infected since? May or may not notice. Do you have hybrid immunity? Um, a lot of your logic here is is reasonable. I think he's, he's probably been infected asymptomatically, I would guess. Yeah, I would, I would suspect. But But the real point is that that third, that second dose too close interrupts the affinity maturation, and it doesn't go back yeah. again. So it's not like it yeah. because it's been a year, Matthew, that it's caught up. No, it never does because it's interrupted. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting the comparison of the UK that did it at three months. You know, for other reasons, not necessarily. Yeah. No, may it may have actually been you know worked yep. out well. Yep. Louise writes, "I'm a family physician in suburban Pennsylvania, and in March." My nephew brought home a cold. His eight-month-old daughter ended up having a seizure and was diagnosed with human metanuma virus. I have not taken care of adults or children with this, and I'm curious if Daniel has seen much of this in his adult population in addition to the RSV, which you've discussed. Yeah, so human metanuma virus, I used to joke, was was one of my favorite viruses. And the reason I said that is it had a clear seasonality, um, you know, and it would, for me, be like, oh, the sun's coming out. So, you know, we would have flu, we'd have RSV. And then in about early April is usually when the meta, human metanuma virus season would, would start in the Northeast, which reminded me spring is coming, time to start thinking about getting the sailboat ready, <laughs> um, you know. It is interesting because human metanuma virus often causes a lot of bronchospasm. So sometimes clinically you get a little bit of a hint. Um, yeah, I don't have a good reference on that. Um, but so, yeah, I've actually seen quite a lot of human metanuma virus, um, you know, in sort of the whole spectrum. And it's quite contagious, right? So mom, dad, grandpa, um, kids, it's enough actually that it'll put folks in the hospital. So um still a little bit out of seasonality. So it, it sort of lost that charm for me at the moment. Um, you know, many viruses have, um, but yeah, it's actually quite common. It's a virus. We don't have any specific antivirals. If you recognize it, it's a good, you know, keep your hands in your pocket with those antibiotics. And JB writes, I am a primary care physician actively caring for COVID patients who recently contracted COVID for the first time, fully vaccinated, but based on risk factors, took Paxlovid on the day, tested positive, initially felt good. Day three, felt extremely fatigued. By day five, felt better, an antigen test negative. Returned to work while masking. Day 10, started feeling URI symptoms again, tested positive for the next five days on a antigen tests, SO SAO2, totally normal through the second week. Mike Osterholm said he took a second course of Paxlovid for folks that get ill again after Paxlovid treatment that clearly aren't hypoxic. Is there a role for for retreating with an antiviral? And as a follow-up, is it possible that we may be treating too early with antivirals, as in my case where I could test ad lib and initiate antiviral immediately and not allowing the immune system to get fully engaged, leading to recrudescence of symptoms? Okay. So Dr. Kettner, this is uh, for everyone out there. This is a great, I'm glad you're asking this and I'm going to go through this because I think that this is a huge misconception and, you know, sorry, Mike, sorry, uh, Anthony, um, <laughs> sorry, Joe, Kamala, everyone else who um, went down this road. Listen, we really now understand um, what we, we thought we understood early on. Now it's really, um, we have a lot of science behind this. It's during the first five um, days that you have the significant viral replication, right? And it goes up, you know, when you do one of those swabs, you're talking millions. Uh, you do a PCR, 12, 13, 14, it comes up hot positive. So the first five days is the period of active viral replication. That is your window of opportunity for antivirals, whether they be small molecule like Paxlovid, Molnupiravir, Remdesivir, whether they be antibody therapies like the cocktails we used early on, um, you do not wait. And I'm going to comment why you do not wait. You lose time. This is like waiting to treat a stroke. If you start that antiviral within the first three days, um, you have better outcomes than if you wait to day five. So I know there were some people out there sort of saying, give your immune system a chance to respond. That is not helpful. That is what we were trying to prevent. We were trying to prevent your immune system from that dysfunctional response. So first week, that's the window for antivirals. We have studied antivirals after that first week 
ad nauseum. They are not helpful. Um, Paxlovid is five days. That's the deal. The second week, right? So then you say on day 10, started feeling URI symptoms again. I'm going to rephrase that. I'm going to say on day 10, you started to experience the cytokine storm, the early inflammatory phase. In most cases, hands in your pockets, antivirals, convalescent plasma, some more Paxlovid, not helpful. I'm glad you were checking your oxygen saturation because a subset of individuals, if the oxygen drops below 90%, a short course of the right dose of steroids makes sense. Um, if you stay in the 90s, you're better off doing nothing. Um, and I think people really have to realize this. Starting that Paxlovid, it's to keep you from having that dysfunctional immune response that ends up getting you into the hospital, ends up triggering something that might lead to your death ends up maybe leading to long COVID. So. so this is the problem, Daniel. Guys like Mike Osterholm, who have a lot of listeners, he does something and, and then everyone thinks they should do the same thing, right? You know, it was tough though, right? Because, you know, I hate to be, you know, Anthony Fauci did this, Mike Osterholm did this, Joe Biden did this, Kamala Harris, you know, a lot of prominent people did this. And you got to realize, like, if you could do something not so just don't tell anyone about yeah, exactly. it. Exactly. You know, because if you tell everyone, you know what, they're gonna do it too. And this the science not only doesn't support this, but we've looked. It's not that there's an absence of science. There's plenty of science. This is not helpful. Yeah, they're not doing trials. They're just one off, and that's not how we do medicine, as you know, in <laughs> science-based yeah. medicine. That's TWIV weekly clinical update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you so much. And everyone, be safe. Hey, we're getting like the news programs. We're, we're, <laughs> we're going back. All we need is a big desk with a glass top and we'll be all set. <laughs>